are so thankful today to get the opportunity, I don't take it for granted, to be able to minister the Word today. You know, we have you come in and we fill you with sugar and donuts, and then we have you jumping up and down, praising the Lord. You got plenty of caffeine, so you've got some juice in you for Resurrection Sunday. And we're excited to be able to, as a church, as a body, as everyone here serving, from our production team to our ushers to our worship team, everybody that is doing such a great job to welcome you and your family. And we want you to feel welcome. My name is Chris Pate, and I am the lead pastor here at City Life Church, and very thankful again to be able to minister on this Easter Sunday. You know, we've been going through a series the past several weeks called Leading Through Uncertainty. I hope it's blessed you as we've looked at different characters in Scripture, actual people, and we've humanized them and helped see that they had the same challenges that we have. Even right now in the midst of all of the uncertainty with social unrest, with COVID, with everything happening, with all of our plans being messed up and everything going on within our lives. This is not a new thing for God. He's not surprised. He's not chewing his fingernails going, what am I going to do? And we get relief in that when we read the scripture together to see that many people in the midst of adversity and problems and uncertainty trusted in the Lord and he came through because he's faithful. Today we get to celebrate that for Resurrection Day. And we're going to talk about the resurrection. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus. Many times on this day, we will do some apologetics even from the stage to say there is ample evidence to believe in the resurrection, that it's not blind faith, but we have beautiful scientific information and evidence to why you should believe in the resurrection. And, and oftentimes we will talk about that because we want to give you strength and evidence for your faith to move forward, to be able to say, yes, the resurrection is real. Today, I want to take a little bit different turn and go into your will and your volition today, not just your head, to look at the character and the attributes of this Jesus who died for us on a cross and on the third day was raised for us, conquering sin and death. But this wasn't the first resurrection that he was a part of. In fact, there were three before that he was a part of. We're familiar with Lazarus and coming out of the tomb and some others. Today, I want to talk to you in the book of Mark chapter 5. I'm going to read through it. And then we're going to learn some things about trusting in Jesus, this resurrection day. Check this out. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little girl is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Verse 25. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, 
you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This scripture and these stories are very powerful in seeing the resurrection power of Jesus in what people around thought about Jesus and who he was, as he showed his disciples the demonstration of his power, not just saying, look at me, look what I can do, but ultimately pointing to the fact that he is God, that he is the Messiah and the one they've been waiting for. All of his miracles were signs ultimately pointing to him and his declaration of this power. Today, out of those scriptures and Resurrection Sunday, I want to increase your faith and increase your trust out of this passage in four things today. I want to talk quickly about increasing your trust in Jesus' pace, his pace of life, increasing your trust in Jesus' priorities, increasing your trust in Jesus' power, and increasing your trust in Jesus' presence. Because, you know, trust in Jesus, belief in Jesus is more than a one-time, one-prayer affair. Me and my wife had had some struggles, not in our marriage, but with other things and other people like you and, and situations. And, and we, we've been going, okay, we, we've got to go to Jesus and give this to Jesus and allow him to take this. And that looks like giving him our worship, not just suppressing our problems and suppressing our emotion, but giving that to him and allowing him to carry that burden. And, and there's specific ways that we do that in our worship and our talk. But I, we were talking about that, having to do that in a specific circumstance with some people and brought so much relief and peace. And then two days later, we had another circumstance. And it's like, this is exhausting. We got to do this again. But that's what it means to trust in Jesus. It's not a one-time thing. It's not like you and your spouse, if you're married, when you go to the altar and you declare your love for one another, and then you just move on with life and never show or express or declare any more that same love or that same vow. It is a relationship, and that's part of the salvation and the resurrection of Jesus, that it's not just a one-time belief and trust, but God wants us to continue to trust in Him in these areas. Let's talk about this out of this passage in this scripture, how do we increase our trust in Jesus' pace? What do you mean by pace, Chris? Well, let me tell you. You've got in this story a beautiful picture that is in actually Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
All three Gospels show this story and this sequence of events where Jesus actually just got done healing a demoniac, someone possessed with demons. He had walked on water and gone through storm and calmed a storm. He had done all of this work, and then he's teaching among the people and this ruler, the synagogue ruler, kind of think about like a, a pastor. So people that they knew him, he might have been somewhat wealthy, at least for sure wealthy in friends and family around him because he ministered at the synagogue. He made his way to Jesus, probably as a last resort because it literally said that he had a daughter that was on, the, on her deathbed, not just sick, but breathing her last. The word is that she is at the end. That word is, is the same word we use for eschatology, the study of the end times. She is in the exact same place of the end of her life. And this man, Jairus, has come and found Jesus. He's heard about him and probably had to humble his heart because he wasn't sure with his proclamations and declaring who this guy is and all of his fame, especially with sinners, that he wanted to go to him, but he probably got to that last resort. My daughter's at her last breath, ran, found Jesus, said that he knelt, knelt down and got on his face like a desperate parent, longing for this one last result. We've done everything. I don't want to see my 12-year-old daughter die. Maybe you've experienced this pain of death and sickness. I know I have within the, my family. And if I knew like there was somebody that has been healing, I would do everything to get to that person, even if it meant having to humble my very heart. And he had to do that, and he went. And the beautiful thing about Jesus, this is so beautiful. You know, we talk a lot about don't just go to Jesus for your needs. Go because you want him, because you want all of him. But the beautiful thing about God is he's okay for you to come to him for your needs as well. He is so much more gracious. And the pace that he walks in in life is so different than us. He sees Jar Jairus and he says, yes, I'll go with you. In the midst of his teaching, he interrupted him. Yes, I'll go. They start to walk, and the pace that Jesus is in, you imagine, because think about yourself in that position as a father with a child dying, like on their last breath. I've got to get there. We got to go fast. We got to hurry. We got to get to the next thing, and we can all relate to this because we want to just get over all of the craziness that's going on in life right now, and we just want to hurry and get to the final destination, not be a part of the means and the problem or, the, or the, the, the process, but just get to the final destination. And especially when life and death is on the line, Jairus says, let's go, let's go. Come on, probably trying to hurry Jesus. And Jesus is on his way. And all of a sudden he stops and he goes, who touched me? Now you have to realize Jesus always had hundreds, if not thousands of people around him because of the things that he could do especially in poor communities where they couldn't afford a doctor or didn't have some of the things that they need. They're looking to him to heal them, even to feed them as he's fed 5,000 people. Plus, there's all of this need around him constantly, people around him, so much so the disciples look at him and sarcastically say, what do you mean who touched you? There's people everywhere. People are always crying out to God, trying to get a touch. But he said, I'm used to people trying to touch me. This person touched me different. It was a touch like David crying out to me. It was a touch like Moses or Joshua crying out for help. It was a faith touch, not just if you can, maybe, but I know you will because you're good. It was that kind of touch. And he literally said, power left me because of the faith of this woman. But I want you to put yourself in Jairus' shoes. The pace of Jesus would and does frustrate all of us. The pace of God when we say, why aren't you hurry? Finish, do what you are called to do. Do what I'm asking you to do. We've got to fix this now. And Jesus stops and says, my pace is different than you. The pace that I work is not the same as yours. We know this being a very multicultural church and a part of every nation, uh, which is the organization that our church is a part of, a, a family of churches all over the globe in 80 countries. We know this. Time is relative. 
depending on the different nation you're at, you know? I remember going to mission trips overseas. It's like church starts at 10, but it's 11, and we haven't started yet. What's happening? And it's supposed to be over at 12, but it's 3 p.m., and we're still going, right? Time is relative depending on the culture, and that's not necessarily bad. There's not necessarily a right or wrong unless it offends you. But culturally, time can be relative, and I would say with God and His pace, time is relative. And He's always late to us, but He's always on time according to His will. We've got to learn to trust in the pace. We read the rest of the story, but imagine how frustrated this father would have been. Going, why in the world are you stopping? That leads me to the next. We've got to trust in the priorities of Jesus. Imagine being in an emergency room in the medical center. And you have two different people. Maybe you're a doctor or a nurse. You're checking someone in, and you have two different people. One person who has had an issue for 12 years, it's not life or death necessarily, but wants to be healed, wants to see the doctor. And another person, a child who's 12 years old, that is breathing her last. Which one do you prioritize? Of course, for us, we prioritize the one that's about to die. See, Jesus' priorities are very different. Instead of rushing to this one and saying, lady, I'll get to you, he stops frustrating the pace of everybody else around him, even his disciples. But because his priority was what God was doing right then and there in that time, because here's the deal. He felt power go out from him. He knew this woman had received some kind of healing, but he wasn't good with her just receiving a healing and being secret about it. He wanted to make sure that she knew that he knew something had happened. See, he prioritizes the relationship and ultimately, listen, the spiritual healing and her knowing that God loves her and wants a relationship with her and not secretly just getting her thing and moving on, but exposing that, talking truth to her, taking the time to care for her more than just her body, but her eternal soul. Knowing that that little girl might die, but he himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. I will prioritize eternal salvation over physical any time because I can do both. But right now, this woman is important. See, his pace is different than ours, and we have to learn to trust it when we want to rush it. His priorities are different than ours when we're thinking, why in the world? Would you do it like this? Also, his priorities speak to us today in this idea. Jairus is a male in a society in which men had absolutely all the power. This is a female, the woman with the issue of blood. Jairus is a synagogue ruler. You would think his status and who it is, yeah, I'm going after you. I'm going to help you. This woman is ceremonially unclean, hasn't even been able to go to worship and be in a synagogue. This man is almost certainly rich, at least in friends and family. This woman, we know, is absolutely poor. She spent all of her money trying to get better. Here's a man at the top of the social food chain, and here's a woman at the very bottom of the social food chain. And yet, Jesus turns to the woman with zero social economic capital and power, gives her his full attention. That's the kind of God I want to worship. Treats her as if there's nothing else in the world but her. He turns to her, this zero status and power, and makes this man who's a civil and religious leader wait in the moment of his greatest need. You can wait outside, please. This is my priority. What's happening? This isn't unusual for God. If you actually read Scripture, this is how He works. It's upside down to our priorities and our ways. Stepping on people to get to where we need to be. 
looking at the most advantageous path and going after it where God does not work this way throughout the Gospels, throughout the Old Testament, over and over. You see this in Jesus' life when he looks at the Pharisee and a publican or a tax collector. When he looks at a religious leader and a fallen woman, over and over you have this insider and you have an outsider. And it seems that Jesus really, really likes these outsiders and gives them priority. He's always connecting to them really quickly, and we see this constantly helping others. And we talked about this last week. In fact, Paul makes reference to this. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, his letter to the church in Corinth, he says this, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Do you trust his priorities? and Make them your own. Do you ever feel like, well, I'm not good enough, I'm not that guy, or I'm not like this, or I'm not like that, and God's going, I'm coming after you, I want you. I'm not just looking for the best or the elite. In fact, I'm looking for the humble. As Scripture says, he exalts the humble and will humble those who exalt themselves. And Jairus felt this sense of his priorities are different. Do we trust in Jesus and his resurrection power? That leads me to the third one, two more. Trust, I want us to increase and grow today on Resurrection Sunday in Jesus' power, what he is able to do. From verse 35, you see it. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house, we saw, some who said, your daughter is dead. So he's still talking to this woman, giving her his attention completely. And then someone comes along and tells Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But overhearing what he said, Jesus still so full of compassion at, the, at a different pace than everybody else, turns and looks at the ruler of the synagogue and says, do not fear, only believe. Can you imagine if Jesus looked at you eye in your worst moment, the time, the worst thing that's ever happened to you, and he says, don't be afraid, believe, trust me, trust my power, what I can do. As people are saying, don't bother him anymore. Let me ask you a question. At what point in life have you ever thought, why bother asking God? Why bother now? It's over. I think the disciples felt like this as they watched Jesus die on a cross. At least one disciple that watched it. The rest that scattered and knew about it. They felt, why bother What did we just give all of our life to? Maybe you felt that sense of despair because his pace and his priorities are not the same as yours. But in the midst of that, can you trust his power and what he can do? There's no time, let me say this, where you are troubling God too much. There's no time where you need to stop troubling God and going to him as if he can't do something still even in the midst of sorrow. We learn this here, and, and, and he steps into the house of Jairus, and people start telling him, hey, this is over. He sees the commotion and the wailing and everything that's happening because they've just lost a daughter. And he tells them, why are you sad? He's like, I'm here. Don't you know who I am? And he doesn't say that in a conceited wrong way, but in a confident way, he knew who he was. And they laughed at him because he said she was asleep. Now, he wasn't literally saying she was asleep. He knew in the culture that oftentimes they would use this as a euphemism, that they're asleep, which means they're dead or they're, they're with at, at Abraham's bosom. The, the, the scripture would refer to they're resting. They're in a place of rest. And they laughed at him, taking him literally. And I love this. Jesus is so powerful. That to him, death is as easy a cure as simply waking up someone from sleep. 
Look at the power of Jesus and trust in what God can do. He shows up, says he grabs her hand. He makes everybody leave. He leaves Peter, James, and John, and then he has the parents. He says, everybody else, get out of here. He touches her hand, and with a simple word, he says, Talitha kum, which is Aramaic. As your scripture says, it means little girl, get up. In fact, though, in Aramaic, Talitha is more of a pet name. It's not just little girl. It's like us saying honey, or I love in Texas, we say sweetheart. Jesus literally grabs her hand as she's dead and says, sweetheart, it's time to get up. The power of Jesus where death is like just waking someone up from sleep. The thing that we fear the most, dying, whether it's to our career, our social status, or our physical body, Jesus says, that's nothing to me. And he looks at her and says, honey, it's time to get up. Can you imagine being in that room and going, oh my gosh. I've seen you walk on water. I've seen you calm the storm. I've seen you deliver demons, but we've never seen anything like this. Do we trust the power of Jesus? You see, right then and there, he kicks the enemy and death in the teeth, and later on a cross and ultimately through his resurrection, he's going to put a final nail in the coffin for death. And this is only a prequel of what's to come. The power of Jesus. The last thing I want to encourage you to trust in Jesus' presence. Jesus, at his pace, with his priorities, with his power, was the most non anxious presence that's ever walked this globe. Someone like that in the midst of our culture where it's hurry, where it's go, where I've got a dog eat dog, get to the next level. Jesus says, my presence brings a different pace to your life. A non-anxious pace and presence. My resurrection gives you the same pace and gives you different priorities. And gives you the power of God. Because ultimately, the scripture says, if you want real joy, it's in the presence of God. Psalm 16 is fullness of joy. Jesus not only says, look at me, and, and notice even when he reaches his hand to raise the girl from the dead, he doesn't raise, you know, his, his sleeves and go, watch this, everybody. He's simply with a word. And it's that same power and that same presence that he says the resurrection now, he, out of the resurrection, he's given us that presence within us. He's given us that pace and that power. Why in the world would you want to ever hurry someone like this? Why in the world would you ever think, God, what are you doing? I don't trust you. You can't do it. When you look at Jesus, he says, if you see me, you've seen the Father. I am in the Father. I am God, you've seen me, you can trust in me for every area of your life. Not just Sunday morning, not just Resurrection Sunday, but as you're going about in your pace, as you're prioritizing, as you're looking for power, the presence of God is available. That's what we get to celebrate today. One last thing that's interesting in this story that I see is when he resurrects her, he tells the family, day, don't say anything. I'm not, I'm not ready to die yet. All the religious people coming after me, questioning me, he says, don't say anything. But then he says this, and I think it's profound. He says, give her something to eat. She's hungry. You see, the pace and the priority and the power and the presence of Jesus gives you a different life, resurrects a different life into you as well, but it should always create a hunger. He knew she's hungry. In my presence, it creates a hunger and a new type of hunger for a new type of people, a hunger for his presence, a hunger for more of him. 
This is why we encourage you to get in community. We encourage you to get around people that are in the word that are going to help give you the true hunger. Not, not the fake stuff that the world and everything else offers, but the true hunger that comes with resurrection power. This hunger is what feeds our soul. In this time, everyone should have walked in. And it's a great day to celebrate communion together. We got to, on Good Friday, do the same. But if you're comfortable taking your mask off, all that, we want to honor people's convictions. But we have our communion here. And the hunger of God goes far more than just trying to get fulfillment in our stomach. But part of our communion and what Jesus has called us to do is trust him and remember him and that's what we do in this moment as we celebrate communion together it's more than just a random tradition it is something to invite the very presence of God in my life making the resurrection personal, permanent and powerful with me but let me tell you communion is also community based Listen, don't just take it lightly. As you take that bread, you are not only saying, I'm trusting this Jesus with all of my life by being reminded of his body that was crushed and the blood that was spilled for my sins. But listen, you're also in a communal way with people that have common unity, community in Jesus. You're also saying, I'm willing to, to be crushed myself in order to have communion. In other words, I'm willing to forgive others. I'm willing to trust the people around me that you have entrusted to me. Not to put all my trust in them, that only goes to you, but to, to continue to walk in love and forgiveness and help because your personal relationship with Jesus and communion is now also going public. That's what communion is all about. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup. We proclaim, God, our trust in you. Lord, our thankfulness for this resurrection Sunday. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you're in here and you're really struggling trusting Jesus with all, the point and the goal of the scriptures is pointing to him to say he's trustworthy. We sang it earlier, he's great. How great thou art. This act of volition of our will to say, God, I give you my all because you're great. You're trustworthy. Your resurrection is proof and power enough. If you've never done that, we want to invite you into the family of God. It's not something you have to do where you have to go through a, a class to understand everything and then you're good enough. Or you have to, uh, like, like getting ready for the dentist, you brush your teeth right before, which there's enough damage. You don't have to get right before you go to God. The fact is Jesus has already made you right if you trust in him. 
the works that he has done, the victory over sin and death is a declaration of his power. And our act of worship is not just raising our hands, is not just singing, is not just listening, but a literal giving our lives, ourselves to him. Healing, helping you is easy, but what he wants is you. What he wants is a relationship with you. And today, what a beautiful day to begin and start that relationship, to have that peace and the power and the pace of Jesus living in you. If you've never done that, I just want to invite you to pray right where you are with me. And, and, and it's a simple, so the Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. If you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he died for your sin, you will be saved, according to Romans 10, 8 and 9. It's as simple as that. It's the trust in Him. If you want to do that, let's just pray. You could pray this quietly to yourself, but let's make this an action worthy of our worthy God who gave us all. Father, I confess my need for you. I'm not perfect, I'm not righteous on my own, I need a savior. I declare and I believe that you died on a cross for the world's sin and for my sin. I believe that you rose again on the third day for my sin, to give me life and peace in your presence to bring me back into relationship with you. I put my trust in Jesus for my salvation. And I now trust that I am a son or daughter of you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that, we would love to help you walk in that trust in community and as a church family. Welcome to the family of God. We want to hear from you. We want to know whether you're online or live here. We serve a trustworthy God, don't we? I want to encourage you. We did a special thing with a dance company, Christian dance company called Adeum here on the screen. Check this out as an act of worship to the Lord.